welcome to video number four in our series of how New Orleans jazz sounds different than Chicago jazz and why these differences occurred and why they're important to pop culture of America at the time and still today. How have they affected us? So in this video, we're going to cover some things that we didn't get to cover in the last video, such as slave music and how that influenced jazz. Um, military brass bands from the Civil War era, how they contributed a little bit to helping jazz develop, and how these elements came together in New Orleans just at the right time to form this music that we call jazz, or New Orleans polyphony. But let's have a quick review of the stuff from the previous videos. Um, video number two, we discussed those four elements of jazz, those four elements that we learned back in sixth grade that give jazz its unique quality of sound. And they were the backbeat, improvisation, syncopation, and extended harmony. However, like I said in the last video and the video before, for this unit on Chicago versus New Orleans jazz, we do not need to understand what extended harmony is or how that affects music. Um, in the last video, we discussed some elements that come together, some musics that came together to form jazz. What were the musics that were popular at the time? So we talked about the history of New Orleans, where it came from, how it became a state through the Louisiana Purchase, and we discussed this place in New Orleans called Congo Square. Congo Square was a place where on Sundays, slaves would be able to, to get together, different slaves from different plantations, and they could um, talk with each other, share ideas, including music. And some of the ideas maybe they had improvised while working on the, the farm, working on the plantation, they can share these newly uh, formed improvised ideas with other slaves, maybe make their work or their life a little bit easier. I, through the power and the magic of this green screen, I have traveled back in time. I am in Port Royal, South Carolina, right after the, the Civil War. So here, something really amazing was about to happen. A man named Charles Pickard Ware, a music historian from up north, noticed that um, there was this music from the south that had not, been, had not been documented. And that was the music of the slaves, the songs of these slaves. So he set out on a mission. He left up north and he traveled down through the south and he met with various different um, um, ex-slaves at this time because they had been freed. This was 1866, 1867. And he finally made it to Port Royal, South Carolina, where he started to document the songs of these slaves. And he published his book titled simply, Slave Songs of the United States in 1867. This is the first true publication of slave songs from the United States. Getting this book published and getting this book written was not easy. He had some major hurdles to, to get over. Um, one hurdle where the slaves were not trained in music. They didn't know how to express musically what they were doing. And this posed some other problems. Since they were not trained in music, they used notes that were not part of our current music system, which means they had notes and sound combinations that we could not write down because our music system had no way to accurately do that. Slave songs also used something called polyrhythms. Polyrhythms were two different rhythms going on at the same time that in our system of music wouldn't really be done. So a new way of writing rhythm had to be discovered to get some of these polyrhythms down. And a fourth problem is these slaves were not educated so they did not use English correctly. And they often had words that were really far from their original pronunciation or completely new words altogether being used in these songs. So Mr. Ware had to come up with a way to phonetically write these things down. So as you read some of the words to these songs, instead of the word maybe brother being spelled B-R-O-T-H-E-R, it would be spelled brother, B-R-O-D-E-R, because he was trying to accurately capture the way they were saying and pronunciating the words. He wanted the diction along with the music. The next video clip I have gives a brief history of the European slave trade in the Western Hemisphere. It also discusses how the slave trade made it to North America through major ports of entry such as Charleston, Savannah, and New Orleans.
The origins of jazz history began some 400 years ago, in the 1600s. At this time, England, France, Spain, Portugal and Holland were competing with each other to control the slave trade. Millions of Africans, mostly from Ghana, Togo, Benin and Nigeria, were captured and transported away from their families and homelands. They were taken to the Caribbean islands and Spanish colonies in Central and South America, and later to British North America. The slaves were then sold, then forced to work, often in atrocious and inhuman conditions, treated merely as possessions. They were no longer free people, who were often beaten and frequently died from overwork. Because the slaves had come from different countries of origin in Africa, they spoke many different languages and had different ethnic traditions and beliefs. They also came from countries in which musical traditions were very diverse and had a long history. So how did slave songs help jazz to be created? Well, Slave songs are typically broke down into three different categories, and they are work songs, recreational songs, and religious songs. In the plantations, the slaves sang spirituals, work songs, and blues, which the traveling musicians performed in their concerts. In the early 1900s, ragtime music and New Orleans jazz, latterly known as Dixieland jazz, developed from the fusion of the blues, spirituals and various European musics. We need to stop for a moment and think about what was just said. So we may study it better. Here is that text again. In the early 1900s, ragtime music and New Orleans jazz, also called Dixieland, which is the style of music that we are studying right now, developed from a fusion of the blues, spirituals and various European musics. If you think back to our last video, The Genesis of Jazz Part 1, we discussed how the blues, ragtime, were coming together with this music from the Southern Baptist Church, this call and response. After this segment on slave music, we're going to discuss this European music influence on early jazz. This magical quality captured the hearts of millions of Americans, both black and white, alike. Pioneers like pianist composer Scott Joplin, known as the King of Ragtime, pianist Jelly Roll Morton, blues singer Ma Rainey, and composer W.C. Handy, called Father of the Blues, paved a road on which many others would travel. Joplin's sheet music was sold to millions of Americans who wanted to play it on their pianos in their homes. Scott Joplin became the first African American to be a famous celebrity performer. Although slavery had been abolished by now, between 1910 and 1940, Nearly two million African Americans left their homes in the southern states of America to look for work and to get away from the harsh racism there. They moved to the northern industrial cities like Chicago and New York. As they traveled north, they brought with them the new jazz music. Some of the stars of that time were trumpet player Louis Armstrong from New Orleans and the son of a German immigrant, Dick Spiderbeck, one of the great cornet players. Three of these categories, if you think about it, deal with the text, with the meaning of the words, the literary, the literal meaning of what the English on top is saying. So if we take away the fact that the words have meaning, and just think of the words as being another instrument, the music underneath all three of these styles tended to be the same. So the same music I use to pray to God, the same music that I would use as I'm out in the field trying to get through my day of working. I may change the words to meet the situation, whatever the environment is. So if my environment is church, so obviously my words will have a sacred meaning to them. If my environment is the work, I'm out in the field, well then my words will most likely be about getting through the work, getting through the day. And if my song is about recreation, about having some time on my own to think about things that happen in my daily life, then the words would be about that. 
my daily life. So how did these forms, three forms of music come to help jazz evolve? Well, eventually, if we fast forward to the early 1900s, these three forms of music become what we call the blues and the call and response of the, of the Southern Baptist Church. The Southern Baptist Church music and the blues, they're really the same. So what we have is that angel and that devil using the same music, but for different literary purposes. In the way that profound things almost always happen, a thing and the opposite of that thing are mashed together. Now you have the people getting the spiritual sound of the church, and they also are getting that secular sound of the blues. And the musicians who could understand both of those things and put both of them in their horn side by side so they could represent that angel and that devil, <laughs> that was the ones that could play. In the next section, we're going to discuss how European-style music and the instruments from military brass bands from the Civil War came together in a most unique way that would provide instruments to kids of all races during Reconstruction. Reconstruction lasted from about 1865 to 1899. These generations, the children and the grandchildren of slaves, would start the musical journey that would eventually give us jazz. You have musicians playing their horns. They have all these instruments that are left over from the Civil War. The military instruments and the trumpets are played in a militaristic style. Boom, 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 boom. Then all of a sudden, instead of playing in a straight military style of a hymn or a beautiful melody, now they're imitating the sound of the people in the church singing. They have the vibrato at the end of the note. They're shaking those. Uh, it's a do, di, di, bo, di, lu, di. Then the music gets another power and feeling. The three instruments Mr. Marcellus was just talking about were the clarinet, trumpet, and the trombone. These three instruments will become the backbone of New Orleans style jazz, just as these next few photos will show. Here we have a photo of the original Dixieland Jazz Band, the first band to record jazz music. Notice the three wind instruments they are playing. There's the trombone, the trumpet, and the clarinet. In the next photo, we see Buddy Bolden's group. Once again, we have the same three instruments, the trumpet, the trombone, and the clarinet. Here we see Joe King Oliver's band from New Orleans with the young teenage Louis Armstrong. This band using the same instruments, two trumpets, trombone, and a clarinet. All right, so once again, through the power and the magic of green screen, I am able to travel back in time to get a better idea of where jazz came from. As you can see, we are in a battle of the Civil War. So how did military brass bands help jazz to evolve? Well, let's see. Since we are discussing military brass bands, I thought it would be a good idea to see what one looked like. Here is a group of soldiers getting ready to march into battle. And just like at the beginning of a football game for high school or college when the band leads them on, the band here is going to lead them onto the field. If you look closely at the picture, notice what's at the front, the musicians. It looks like if they march in, they will be the ones to march in first. I wonder if they're the first ones to be shot. After this man, President Abraham Lincoln won the Civil War, bringing an end to the fighting, the soldiers who survived returned to their homes. And this includes musicians who played in the military brass bands during the Civil War because they were soldiers too. This left a lot of instruments without an owner or with an owner who played the instrument very little. Many of these leftover instruments were donated to orphanage, churches, and schools and other places where the kids would be able to have them. 
Finally, to answer that question, how did European music influence early jazz? Well, to this I offer two answers. Number one, this man, John Philip Sousa, he composed marches during the late 1800s, the late 19th century, and he composed military marches for the U.S. government. Well, Mr. Sousa is an American, and it's true the music he wrote was all American music, but it followed traditional European styles. He was doing fresh and unique things, but he was still doing it in a European way. Number two, I offer this answer. These instruments, the clarinet, the trombone, and the trumpet, are all much older than the United States. These instruments come from Europe and European ways of doing things. So they follow, just by accident, the rules and the mechanics of European music traditions. In the next section, we're going to discuss New Orleans polyphony. Listen to Wynton Marcellus describe how the military brass bands of the Civil War helped New Orleans polyphony to be born. He's the first one who really successfully wrote down the New Orleans polyphony. And that means the three horn, the, the, the trumpet, the clarinet, and the trombone when they're playing three different things. Polyphonic music is also called polyphony. They are one and the same. To understand what this word means, let's break down the syllables. Poly meaning more than one, phonic meaning sound. Therefore, polyphony is music containing two or more lines of music that are independent from one another. So what do I mean by this? In the next video clip, you will see a band perform traditional New Orleans polyphony. Notice how the trumpet, clarinet, and the trombone are not playing the same musical ideas, yet the parts all musically work without becoming noise.